And so it's an account in the life of Jesus. Uh, once more Jesus visited Cana in Galilee, uh, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick in Capernaum, a place about 20, uh, 25 k's away uh, from Cana. When this man heard that uh, Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, uh, he went to him and he begged him to come to heal his son who was close to death. Unless you believe, uh, unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. And while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. And when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, it was then that the fever left him. And then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And so he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign that Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. The Lord will always bless the hearing of his word. The first thing that I want uh, to point out and I want us to note is that uh, in the passage that I read to you, Jesus is asked to perform a miracle from a particular person. All right, that's the first thing. And so in the same way that uh, Jesus was asked to perform a miracle at the wedding of Cana by his mother, a particular person, um, Jesus is again asked to perform a miracle. But this time from a person very, very different to his mother. We are told that the person asking for the miracle is a royal official. And it is this royal official who approaches Jesus to ask him to act or to intervene in such a way that is going to be of benefit to his son and to himself and to his family. Now the figure of this official stands in contrast uh, to the figure that was in the first son, Mary. The royal official was one of Herod's employees. And the royal palace was not a pro-Jesus. Some would say the royal palace was not even pro-Israel, although they were Jewish. But Herod's family was regarded as a family that had sold their soul for the privilege of favour amongst the Roman occupation of Palestine. They were sellouts. Matthew records um, the life of Jesus as an infant being threatened by Herod the Great in the royal palace, the father of Herod Antipas. Why? Because the presence of Jesus and this possibility of a new king in Israel threatened their well-being, their privilege, their existence. And so there was the order uh, to eliminate uh, Jesus at birth. We are also mindful um, as the Gospels uh, continue, they speak of John the Baptist being arrested and beheaded by Herod Antipas for speaking out against the immorality that was happening in the royal palace. And so once again, this was considered a threat to the privilege that they exercised, and John the Baptist was beheaded. We further know as we read the Gospels that Herod Antipas would become a key figure uh, in the death of Jesus. And so the request for Jesus to do something for a person who is part of a family who have a history of eliminating anyone to actively protect their life of privilege, we need to hear how odd that request is. 
It's a request from the ranks of power for you to do something for me, even though I don't know you. There's a little bit of bullying going on. There's a bit of intimidation. There's a bit of pressure on Jesus to accede to the request. In fact, there is good reason to suspect that it's not simply a request. At best, it's a loaded request. It may even be a demand. And so that's the request that is in front of Jesus. And that leads to the second thing that I noticed, is that that request does not go unchecked by Jesus. Jesus responds despairingly to the request. And understandably so, because it's a request under duress. It's a selfish request for a favor from someone with whom you have no relationship. It's a purely transactional request, which values and takes something from someone without regard or interest in their personhood. Huh? We do it daily. We go and we take something that somebody else has bought and we go to them and we say, yeah, I want this. And they say, well, it's costing this much. And we say, thank you. And off we go without ever knowing uh, who we bought it from, what their day is like. And so Jesus can't let this moment go without some kind of confrontation. He speaks about this detached inappropriateness of transactional relationship, of wanting a sign of wonder, of wanting a miracle, without wanting the one who is to work the miracle. I don't care about you, I just care about what you can do for me. Is it not the very attitude behind Jesus' teaching of the Son? Remember the son who approaches his father at a late age and says to dad, 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 I know you're not dead yet, but I know that when you die, you're going to give me your inheritance. And so won't you give me your inheritance before you die so that I can go and enjoy life? I don't care about you really. I just want what you will give me. The royal official wants something from Jesus without wanting anything to do with Jesus. He wants the benefit of the works of Jesus without wanting to live a life that includes Jesus. He wants what Jesus offers without wanting who Jesus is. And so we note that Jesus confronts this it's not okay. It's not okay to have this detached transactional relationship with people. And when we enter into that kind of relationship, we can expect Jesus to address it. And then after confronting the royal official with this approach that is empty of any regard for his personhood, Note that Jesus goes on from that moment. That's not the end of the story. Jesus goes on to display a pureness, a holiness, a otherness that is representative of the values of a kingdom that is not on this earth. God's kingdom. Despite the non-personal transactional approach, Jesus goes beyond that. And he says, I take note that you have traveled 25 kilometers to come and speak to me. I take note that there's some hope in you that I can do something for your son. I take note that you have some kind of confidence in me that a miracle can be performed. Jesus hears the plea of a grief-stricken father in fear of his son's life. And Jesus responds, no matter how inappropriate, no matter how misguided, how, no matter how misplaced, no matter how misdirected this royal official is, 
Jesus looks beyond that, looks past it, and notes the good that is in that request. And he responds to this honest and vulnerable and impassioned cry. The third thing that struck me as I was reflecting on this passage is that once again, so this is the second miracle of Jesus according to the Gospel of Mark. Once again, this miracle is accomplished at a distance. It's accomplished without Jesus actually touching or speaking directly to the situation where the miracle is needed. Jesus doesn't pray for the boy. Jesus doesn't rebuke the disease. Jesus doesn't address the boy or his illness in any kind of way. He simply told the father to go home because his son would live. And as we read the Gospel of John, we will see that it will tell us that at the exact time of him pronouncing this, the boy's fever leaves. And so he instructs the royal official to return home because his son is healed. And so while Jesus does not accede to being dictated to by human demand, Jesus will gracefully respond to every human cry. Why? Because that is just who Jesus is. Even if you and I or the royal official does not want to acknowledge Jesus, it doesn't change the fact of who Jesus is. And Jesus responds to the world out of who he is, the incarnate God of unlimited grace. And so you and I can always expect the incarnate God of unlimited grace to respond, even in our misguidedness, even in our inappropriateness, even in our misplaced approaches to him, even when we misdirect it. I don't think it's uncommon for people to see Christ or to turn to Christ for help in their times of need. In fact, as I mentioned at the beginning of Lent, I don't think there's a moment that we are ever free of need. Our approach to Jesus will never be and can never be need free. And so those needs may always uh, mess a little bit with our approach. We might come with a little bit of bargaining. We might come with a little bit of selfish intent. It might be a loaded request every time we approach God in our need. And as a result, there have been and there are and there will be times when our asking for Jesus to do something for us is disproportionate to our relationship with him. We're asking him to do something without really even knowing him. We, like the royal official, we may request Jesus to intervene from a place of entitlement. We might try to twist God's arm in granting our request. God, if you do this for me, I'm telling you it's going to be for your benefit. You are going to see things happen. I'm going to be such a witness for you. Huh? We may, like the royal official, approach Jesus with a request loaded with self-interest and personal gain. We may approach Jesus even out of a sense of admiration without any real commitment from us to live the life that he tells us to live as a Christ follower. And so we just think Jesus is a good guy. You can't go wrong with him. He's to be admired. But we stop at admiring We might hold on to bits of teaching that we admire, bits of teaching that appeal to us, but we add our own extra to it. And so it's almost like a bit of a Jesus light, um, or Jesus basic. 
And then we add to it a bit of wisdom and contemporaneous that is offered by the modern world. Because the Christian message is a bit old and outdated. It needs a bit of modernization. It needs a bit of populist philosophy can add to it and make it what it should be. And so we admire it and we put it into the bowl of everything else that we admire. Now in any of these approaches, we can expect a corrective confrontation from Christ. We can expect Jesus out of despair to challenge our, inappropriateness, uh, our inappropriate request. We can expect Jesus to confront us when we remain disinterested in who he really is and what he is really all about. We can expect an uncomfortable and awkward moment resulting from the shallowness of our deeply ingrained habit of treating others, including Jesus, as some kind of tri transaction. And once what we've got, what we wanted from those, and sometimes we do it to those that are close to us, those that we love a lot, but once we've got what we wanted from them, we move on. We can expect a reprimand for wanting a sign from Jesus without considering him who is to perform the miracle. We can expect our conscience to be pricked by our desire to benefit from the works of Jesus without entering into the life without entering into life with Jesus. But it's not all that we can expect. We can also expect Jesus to display the pureness and the holiness and the otherness of that kingdom of heaven which is made real on earth through Jesus Christ. We can expect Jesus to honour the limited goodness of our approach to him. We can expect the thought or the hope or the confidence that we show in our approach. We can expect that Jesus will respond gracefully to that request. We can expect Jesus to hear the plea of grief for a loved one. We can expect a gracious response from Jesus in every moment where we are honest, in every moment where we make ourselves vulnerable, in every moment where there is an impassioned cry for assistance. And so I want you to hear the invitation in all of this. There's an invitation to you and to me in the second sign. I want you to hear Jesus address you as the incarnate God of unlimited grace. Hear this invitation to accept that Christ will operate beyond the barriers of time and space. God doesn't need orders from you to operate in your life. He doesn't need permission from you to operate in your life. God the incarnate God of unlimited grace is working for your good in your life currently. Hear the invitation of Christ declaring that his grace will go before you. And as we travel back home, we will come to recognize that grace. We will know that it operated at this time because somebody was made well. God will operate without our knowledge. Know that Christ works beyond the limitations of our humanness. Know that Jesus did not need to be physically present to restore life to a royal official's son. He didn't need to do it then, and he doesn't need to be physically present to restore you or to me or to anybody else. He doesn't need to be physically present to make a difference in life now. Will you hear the invitation to accept Christ as the author and as the finisher of our faith? Hear the invitation. Don't just accept the sign. But how about? How about accepting the person and the word that is offered by the sign giver? 
And so, as in the account of the royal official, may we and may our households come to believe in Jesus, and that through this faith, may we come to know God's abundant life. May we discover God's glory in Jesus. May we be drawn into a deeper faith in Jesus as God's grace reaches out to us every single day. And so to the families of those who are baptised today, you know, you know of the God of abundant grace who has gone before your child. Take confidence and keep close to God. Amen. Amen. We pray together. Father, thank you for uh, your scriptures. We thank you that you can take words that were written a long time ago and make them alive. That they speak through your spirit a message to each one of us. And so, Father, we ask for forgiveness. We ask that you may correct any inappropriateness in our approaches to you. But, Father, that you would go on beyond addressing our inappropriateness to hear that which is good in our approach. And we know that you will respond in your mercy and in your grace. And so, Father, we seek in the second week of Lent to just respond a little truer, a little more honestly, a little more lovingly to your love and to the love that comes to us through those that we love. And so be with us on our Lenten journey, we pray. May we be open to your invitation every single day. Bless us and keep us. Amen. Amen.